thank you so much for tuning in today and being a part of this amazing moment that you probably don't even know you're a part of. Today at Transformation Church, this is a special Sunday because every year at this time, we ask God how we are supposed to sacrifice and give above what we normally do and partner with the vision in crazy faith. And today is Crazy Faith Offering Sunday and I wanted to come and personally let you know that this message is not all about giving. It's about God changing something in our heart or transforming something in our heart so that we can see everything that he has for us. So I want everybody to take a deep breath right now. Relax. We don't want something from you. God wants something for you. So as you listen to this message, I want you to see if God's speaking to you in any way, because I believe your best days, your future is attached to your faith. See, faith is believing now what's in the future and bringing that thing into your present. And I believe that many of us have been damaged by things that have happened in our past. And now God wants to heal those things and take you to another place of triumph. So if you are a part of Transformation Nation, you already know what it is. If this is your first time, I love you. Thank you. And I hope you come back. But this is going to be an important message for, I believe, not just this year, but for all the years to come. I hope God blesses you and speaks to you in this message. God bless you. Leslie, we made a decision that this year we were going to end in triumph. And I just know that many of you, I heard my sister Abby even say it, the, the, from the grief to the, to the sadness to the loss. Some of you, you lost four years ago and you're just now realizing. Some of us, it's, it's almost feel like, and I don't want to even, okay, I'll, I'm, many of us have, have just realized that the pain happened. This is the first season you actually feel it. You've been running on adrenaline for the past two and a half years. You've been medicating so you could make it. And God is saying to some of you today that, that the reason why this season has felt so hard is because you're on the brink of getting healed. <laughs> now hear what I'm saying to you. These aren't just rhyming words. This is a prophetic declaration to you. You had to feel it so that he could heal it. And I believe that's why God has been taking our church. I asked God, like, first off, I didn't want to write the book Damaged But Not Destroyed. I just wanted to be healed and write a book called Healed and Hopeful. I mean, it probably would sell more copies and more people would be attracted to it. Like, but God said, I need people to understand I am not going to heal them and not deal with the damage. I'm not, that's called dysfunction. So we've been in almost three months of talks about dealing with our damage. And, and for some of us, it's week 11, and it's the first time you've been saying, ouch. I do think I'm bitter. How I'm sharp at my kids, that comes resentment from how my parents raised me. Oh, why do I always live for the weekend? Oh, the weekend is where I feel that I can go medicate without anybody's judgment. That's why I go to the club. That's why I do the kickbacks. That's why, like, it's the first time you're feeling, oh, I go to church, but I'm not the church. I, I, I participate in worship, but I'm not a worshiper. It's the first time that many of us are feeling, and I want to let you know, your feelings are okay in this family. Now, I know, I know, I know, because in your family, you was, you was told to suck it up. Or even if you had a lot of emotions and you couldn't control it, they'd be like, oh, you know, there she go again. She, you know she's going to be emotional about everything. She's going to cry about everything. God gave you those emotions as indicators, but he doesn't want you to live in them. He doesn't want you 
to be driven by them. And, and today, as we're walking in a moment of crazy faith, I just I ask God to really, really, really help me convey to people who have not stepped out in crazy faith yet how and why they should. I don't want to really... Thank you. Thank you, bro, because they, they, I, I need them to hear every word I'm saying right now. I don't have to preach this message to live it because I already live it. So as I was preparing this week, I had to ask the Holy Spirit to connect me back to a time where I didn't just believe him. Because for over 15 years now, my default is crazy faith. Like, and I know that's not everybody's default. Let me be very clear. I know that's not most people's default. Most people's default is cuss you out. Most people's default is make a plan that if God is involved, cool, but if he ain't, I gotta survive. Okay, y'all wanna be fake. Most people's plan is going back to the abusive relationship. Most people's plan is getting a second, third, fourth, fifth job to make ends meet. Most people's plan, and, and I found out in my, in my life, for some reason I need to acknowledge, because this is very pastoral today, because I wanna help people. I want to bring you from where you are to the place that I believe God wants for all of us to be. And I need you to stop, hear me, stop listening for somebody else right now. This is not a message for them. It's a message, everybody say, for me. This message is for me. If you don't receive it like that, you're going to miss the revelation that I believe that God wants to give divinely and uniquely to you. Not your wife, not your husband. Don't know, you hear that? Stop it. Somebody say, this is for me. The truth of the matter is you can't live off of somebody else's faith. You can be inspired by it. You can be ignited by it, but it will not keep the flame burning if you don't have faith for yourself. And what I found out in my walk, I was raised by parents that were full of faith. But somewhere along the line, their prayers didn't make it happen in my life the way my prayers did. My obedience couldn't be based on what they believed God to do. And I just believe that there are many people in a house of crazy faith. This is a house of crazy faith. That the crazy faith has not translated to your house. And I could be a pastor who was like, cool. As long as the lights is on, as long as the LED screen is big, as long as people keep coming, let's keep rocking it. Because that's what people are doing all over the world today. They are a part of a house, a church house of crazy faith. And do not care if it translates to people's houses. I will never stand up here and ask God to bless this and not bless you. Okay, I'm going to say it again. This does not matter if it doesn't show up in your family. If it don't show up at your job. If it doesn't show up. And the crazy thing about it is most of y'all are okay with that. You're okay being attached to something that God's doing instead of being right in the middle of what God's doing. Okay. I'm passionate about this because it's been 15 years that my default has been crazy faith. What do you mean, Pastor Mike? If I don't got enough, I sow a seed. Like, that's how my, like, my brain works. You don't have enough people for your team? Go find somebody else's business and give them what they need. Like, this doesn't make sense. I know, it's crazy. But my faith is that if I give what I need, that somehow God is going to make some, like, but I would be dumb and irresponsible to come and talk to an audience of thousands of people and act like that's how we all feel. 
If we're humble, open, and transparent, most of us barely made it today. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to be honest. Bunch of us was arguing with our spouse and you ready to divorce them. Be quiet. Look for it. Look, look at me. <laughs> Blink twice. If, okay. <laughs> Somebody's like, aim. The truth of the matter is some of us are about to pull the plug on the business, about to not apply for the next semester, about to give up in the middle of the miracle. And today I came to encourage your faith um, because we got 21 days left in this year, three weeks. And... Um, when God told me that the last four messages of this series, Damaged But Not Destroyed, need to focus on triumph, I got excited because I really do believe it's a prophetic word of how we're coming into 2024, that how you end a thing is the way that you begin a thing. There's nothing magical that happens on January 1st, like, but I believe that God's asking us to end in triumph. Somebody just say, end in triumph. Say it with faith. End in, just one more time, end in triumph. The, the thought process behind this, write it down if you didn't hear last week's message, and I want you to go back and get it, that with God, triumph is always on the other side of trauma. You can be confident in that. So if I'm being hot, I've gone through some traumatic situations in my life. And as I've gone through the traumatic situations, the situations were not the thing that God wanted from me. He wanted my response to acknowledge him. And most of us, when we get in situations that are traumatic, our response, okay, I'm going to say it nicely. Our response is based on how we were conditioned. Many of the way we respond to anything is based on how we were conditioned, how we were raised, how we were brought up. So for some people, if somebody say, what's up? They'd be like, what's up? For other people, depending on how you was raised and where you was raised. If somebody say, what's up? They like, what's up? Okay, y'all just, yeah, some of y'all acting too brand new. But the very same thing gets a different response because of how I was conditioned. So when I say crazy faith, some people are like, oh God, I believe you, I trust you, you're amazing. And for some people I say crazy faith and they're like, I can't afford to lose. I don't know if God's gonna come through for me. When I say crazy faith, it invokes fear instead of faith. My mom believed all that time and nothing ever, uh-oh. And today I want you to take back from your story or your trauma or your training, I want you to take back authority and put it in Christ. And I want you to now see through a lens of what God says about you, not what they conditioned you to believe, okay? Because what I found out is most people in this room, I'm starting slow so you can just walk with me. I'm taking you on a journey with me. Most people have been trained in trauma. You are professional. You are an expert. You should get paid for as much trauma as you've been through and survive. Lady on the front row said, where are they giving jobs out <laughs> for trauma? <laughs> You've been trained in it. And I've been trying to think about like, what would make somebody not believe God? Like he knows the number of hairs on your head. The sun is still in place right one foot closer. <laughs> we all burn. But somehow on a word he spoke one time. The sun is still, the stars show up every night. The moon is a, per, like, do you, yet he don't know what to do with my life. 
I can trust in a job more than I trust in God? It doesn't make logical sense until you acknowledge how hurt or damaged people have been. And what I've started to realize is, yes, God wants us to have triumph, but in the area of using our faith, somebody shout at me faith. Because it's the one thing that God says without faith, it's impossible to please me. We skip over that scripture, but it's like doing everything God wants me to do. Logically only? Because without you can't even be saved without. But I just, want you to, I just want you to see how much of a cornerstone faith is supposed to be in your life. And how much of our lives has been, I don't really trust you, God. Today, I want to explain to you what faith really is. Faith is trusting it in a manner that you can put your weight on it. Nobody in this room or sitting at home prayed before you sat down in the chair you're in. You had faith that whoever built it was skilled enough. To, now they don't know how much you weigh. And some of y'all are blessed. But you still set your blessed butt in that chair, not knowing the maker. But you had faith enough to put your weight on it. Everybody stand up. Come on, just one time. Everybody sit down. You didn't have to pray about that. You didn't need your community group. You didn't need to fast. You did not need to see God confirm it, confirm it over again. Confirm it, Lord. Confirm it, Father. Confirm to me that this is what I'm. Su- All you heard was an instruction, and you obeyed. Because you have seen before that people have sat in these chairs and you yourself may have sat in these chairs. So I no longer have to be convinced of what I already know the chair is capable of. But the story would be very different if I told you to stand up and sit down and your chair broke. That would be traumatic. For other people, it would be hilarious. I don't know why we do that, but when we see people fall, it's like, ah, are you okay? Like, that proves we're evil on the inside without Jesus. Every man. But, But just think about it. If out of thousands of people, everybody stood up and sat down and only your chair broke, you might come to Transformation Church and stand in the back. <laughs> or before you get to your chair, you... Hey, can you sit right here real quick and let me... <laughs> like, you beat them, put somebody else in danger. Switch with me. <laughs> and I just came to say, I get it. I, I understand how your faith may have been damaged if you experience trauma. In so many churches, they was like, just have faith. And it's like, I'm hurt. I want to. I desire to move in crazy faith, but I'm just trying to make sure this doesn't hurt me again. I was a part of a church who did an offering. They called it something different. It was the, it was the uh, living life offering. But we found out that the, the pastor was crooked and was stealing the money. And, and it, he ended up hurting one of my kids. And it's a, it's a miracle I'm in church at all today. Listening to anybody. Because in the same place I tried to use my faith at one point. 
I was hurt in that area. Okay. And what I found out as the most tragic part about trauma is when you go through a traumatic situation specifically in your faith, what it steals is more important than the moment you're in. Does anybody know what trauma steals from you? Watch this. The most tragic part about trauma is many times it silently robs you of your try. Most people have stopped trying because they got robbed at a spot of trauma. You won't do it ever again. You won't get in community. You won't even be friendly to people because your last friend robbed you of the ability to even want to try. Like, and I found out that, that most people when it comes to living in faith, walking in faith, moving in faith, most people have just lost their try. And the try gets lost at a point of trauma. Okay. Okay. That's why we got to heal. Because trauma wants to steal your try. Pastor Mike, why are you saying it 16 different ways? Because you've been trying to figure out why you feel stuck. You've been trying to figure out why God didn't let me go to the next level. He's saying because the next step requires you to do something. But you have lost the faith to try. He told you that he was going to bless you and take care of the business and bring you into the right connection. But you won't even write the business plan. Because you had to close the doors on one business that you started out of your pride, honestly. Like, guys, today all I want you to do is get your try back. If I, if I could just, if I could have faith, try it again. Try to do something that maybe you weren't taught to do. Try to move in a way that doesn't consider the trauma first, but considers your savior first. Because I just don't want to lead a church where it's busting everywhere except in your life. I just will not stand up here year after year and yell crazy faith and you cannot Try to move out of the place that you've been in because you've been damaged. Yep, trauma took your try. You were hurt in a relationship, so you don't want to be in any relationship. No, 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 I'm an introvert. Okay, but that doesn't mean you should be in isolation. Introvert means you don't get recharged by a lot of people. We ain't even saying a lot of people. Anybody? Nobody knows what you're going through. Nobody knows. Oh, but it was the trauma that paralyzed your try. I'm going to say one that's really specific to me that came to me while I was in the back. There's some fathers in here who are bad fathers to their first two kids. And now they have an opportunity to be a good father to the children they have now. And you won't even try to be a good father because of the guilt and shame that's attached to what you missed out on. The trauma of that situation stole your try. Y'all see how quiet it is in here? This is a good quiet. This is a holy quiet. Because I want you to evaluate the places you've been stuck. And I want you to see, has there been anything that stopped me from having faith to do it again? Because today I wanted to let you know, I found out good news in the word of God. Everybody say triumph. <laughs> Everybody thinks triumph is at the end of the movie. When the person's hand is raised with the gold medals around and everybody's clapping and like, you did it. You beat that big giant. You were like, and the, the triumph. 
But what I found out is the title of my message. There's triumph in trying again. What if the outcome is not triumph? What if the obedience step is triumph? See, you're waiting for everything to be done. And God said, you won just by showing up. Okay. You, you, when you go back to the job tomorrow, it was a triumph because you tried again. The first business didn't work. But God said, at the moment you started writing the new business plan, he said, it's a win. The moment you went to marriage counseling, after you were already decided in your mind and your heart on divorce, it was a triumph. The fact you let that big kid that is spoiled and ungrateful back into your house for one more week. Because he said, sorry, mama. It's a triumph because you're trying. And if you could get this, it would take away the enemy's power to convince you that you're so far away from the destination that you should give up. And I just feel the weight of people like, what is this going to do? What is this little thing going to do? What is this one thing going to do? How is this going to change? Boy, if I could tell you that every great miracle that has ever happened in my life came with a simple instruction. And it might have sounded crazy, but I still had to try it. And this is how the Holy Spirit said it to me. He said, Michael, I want you to tell the people that I need them to try again because I need them to give me something to work with. He said, I'm looking for something to multiply. I'm looking for something to turn water into wine, but there had to be water. Give me something. And he said, my people have been paralyzed from trying. Now I can't even do nothing. You keep praying, but I give you an instruction. You won't obey it. I told you, go join that group. Well, God, there's so many reasons why I wouldn't join a group. And if I join a group, then they're going to make me the leader. And I don't want to be a leader right now. I'm still damaged. And Lord, I need to be like, stop. You don't know what God's going to give him something to work with. We want God to do a miracle with no matter. And you can apply it to any area of your life. But what God is requiring of us is not something great. He said, if you have faith as small as a, that is the smallest seed known to man, but it's something. And God said, will you give me something to work with? Because there's triumph in trying again. I found this story that's not talked about a lot in the Bible about this man named Naaman. Second Kings chapter five. You can read the whole thing if you want to, but I'm gonna give you a little paraphrase of what happened. Naaman was successful and by all world standards. He was a commander. He was killing people. He had money. He was status up. And then he ran into trauma. He, he got diagnosed with leprosy. And I know y'all don't know what leprosy is. Y'all think that's like something that like some acne medicine can clear up. But this is not that. People's literal noses and ears would fall off because of this disease. Back in this day, if you had leprosy, people could not be around you at all because it was so contagious. So this man goes from having a lot of success to now being in this this very traumatic situation. What ends up happening is he uses his connections and he says, ain't there somebody that can can heal me? And, and, And they heard that there were some people who could heal in Israel. So his boy writes a letter to the king of Israel and says, hey, um, I have a friend named uh, uh, Naaman. Can you heal him of leprosy? The king is like, what the heck? I'm not God. It's in the Bible just like this. And he gets so anxious and, and like, like, like weirded out that he rips his clothes off. He's standing there in his kingdom in the nude like, how in the world am I supposed to heal this man? And Elijah, the prophet, hears about it. And he says, king, put your clothes back on. Bring the man to me. I'll prove to him that there's a God in Israel. So this is where we pick up the story in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 8. When Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent this message. 
Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a message to say to him, go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. For most of us, that would have been like, bet. Amen. That's all I need to do? Go take seven baths? Great. Look at his response. But Naaman went away angry. He didn't even want to try it. Because I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, wave his hand. And I thought he would stand and call on the name of his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure my leprosy. He's going to say, go to the door and that's nasty water. Are not Abana and Para Para? If that's wrong, ask your mama. <laughs> the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in rage. His outer sickness was supposed to be healed, but he did not get the miracle the way he wanted it. So he turned around and now had an outer sickness and an inner sickness. Because rage, he didn't even, nobody even came at him. It was because of his own thoughts. He said, I thought. And, and let's not act like he's like alone because a lot of our disappointment in Christ comes because our thoughts don't line up with his. I thought I'd be married by now. Look at me. I thought they would recognize my gift. And I thought I'd be a millionaire. I thought my family would have said sorry by now. I thought. And it's your own thoughts that come against the simplicity of how God may want to heal you. Okay, okay, okay. But thank God for the people that were around Naaman. Naaman's servants went to him and said, all right, boss, um, we came all this way. And, okay, I know you, so if, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you have not done it? How much more then when he tells you to try something simple, he literally said, wash and be cleansed. So Naaman was like, all right. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. How many times? Seven. How many times? Seven. It's going to be important. He dipped seven times as the man of God had told him and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young baby boy. He got the miracle and never was touched by the man of God. I know that messes with a lot of people. See, if I just get a torch, if you just obey. Like, I just want, I want to take it away from this and this and this and this. All, we believe in laying on hands. We believe in all that. But God is with you every day, all the time, everywhere. And if he gives you an instruction, no matter how simple it is, obey it. Okay. What'd you say? Just do it. Like why? Why do we need it to be grand for it to be God? Okay, okay. Let me say it to you like this. Crazy faith, because everybody coming in crazy faith today. Watch this. Crazy faith is about obedience more than the outcome. I want to let you know that the man's outcome was he was going to be healed. But if he didn't try to dip, not seven times, if he did not dip the first one. 
This is where I want to explain what faith looks like. It wasn't when he got healed, he was walking in faith. It's when he decided to get in the, the, the water the first time. That's when crazy faith was unleashed. Because he tried. He tried. My question to you is where are you missing out on miracles? Because you will not try. So Pastor Michael, what do you want me to do? I want you to do that thing that you have been paralyzed to do because you were hurt, scared, fearful in another season and it robbed you of your try. Do that thing. And everybody has something coming to your mind right now. Everybody got something that God has already told them. You're supposed to have been released a whole album and you ain't written one song. You got 50 million ideas for a nonprofit and you just non-profiting. <laughs> you just have no profit. <laughs> Why won't you? It's the greatest act of crazy faith that many of you will make for the rest of this year. Everybody say try. try. Say it with faith. Try. Say it like you mean it. Try. You're talking to your own self. It's not a message for somebody else. Abby, this is your message. Okay. Just try. You never know what God will do. That man did not get in that water. And be like, oh, I've seen like 15 other people dip seven times and get healed. He was mad because he thought it was simple. But the other reason he was mad is because he thought it was crazy. What the heck? There's cleaner water. I'm dirty. Why would I go get in something dirty to get clean? Why would I? Ain't there better places if this is how you want to do it, God? If you want to, you would, well, if I'm supposed to be a pastor, tell Pastor Mike to take me under his wing and make me a junior pastor. Come on, this is how we think. Why in the world am I serving kids? Why in the world am I working this job? Tell him, he speaks, you speak, we're going to see if he speaks then. And because everybody say we thought it should be one way. We stop trying. Okay, all right, all right, I'm gonna keep moving. I wrote this down in a phrase. It says, so many people get discouraged by the distance between where they are and whatever they desire that they become disabled, believing that trying would be an act of delusion. Let me say it again. You got it. She said, run that back. So many people get discouraged by the distance between where I am today and whatever they desire, that they become disabled in the present, believing that trying would be an act of delusion. It would be crazy for me to start working out. Because the last time I worked out, it was good. I lost 22 pounds, then a global pandemic. And I didn't gain 22, I gained 44. And now every time I try to go to that freaking gym, I'm four years older, these knees, okay, y'all know what I'm talking, these, these knees are kneeing, and my back is back in, and I wanna unfat my back, but the way this is set up right now, I'm just going to be fat and happy. <laughs> I, okay. You, you. Now there's people laughing and you should see the people that are looking at me with the stare of death right now. Because it, beca- it came too close to home. Because you're so far away from where you want to be and you know you should be that the enemy has disabled your try today. Okay. But I'm encouraging you to use your faith again. 
I'm encouraging you to say, God, okay, if there's something you're telling me to do, I don't got to know how it's all going to work out. I don't know how it's going to finish or end, but I know that I can obey you in the next step. God, I will try again. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. I know. I know. I know. I know. You wanted to yell today. You wanted to shout about something you're not going to actually do. I'm sick of that. Why, why would we gather at the tune of thousands of people to shout about something we're not going to live out on Monday? That seemed dumb to me. But what if, what if we could actually get to the heart of the matter? I'm almost done. And we, we could all make a collective crazy faith, faith step again. And everybody shout at me, try. try. Say it like you mean it. Try. The outcome of anything is not the proof of faith obedience is. I'm going to say it again. The church has done a bad job of convincing people that get in the house was faith. That's not proof of faith. When God told you to make the budget, obe- everybody say obedience. obedience. That's why no matter what you're going to give in this crazy faith offering, so many people are going to, they're going to use a fa- faith. Don't cancel out your sacrifice. By not obeying. Because the scripture says obedience is better than whatever you sacrifice it. God, I'm giving you $200. He's like, I would much rather you go say I'm sorry. Okay. Is this a prosperity gospel? No, no, no. Prosperity gospel wants a paycheck. What we want for you is actual transformation in your life. Hear what I'm saying to you. Keep the money if you're going to be disobedient. They won't say that at other churches. They'll be like, give us your money and be disobedient. No. That defeats the whole purpose. Back in SoFly, we used to say this because I was so so adamant about this. I said, if you don't want to give, keep your stanky dollars. And it was, y'all remember that? It, it was, it was, it, I felt so good saying, because it was not about amounts. It's always been about obedience. And what I'm saying to you today, church, as we're moving into this step of crazy faith, don't give and then not do what God has called you to do. Okay? Hear me, hear me, hear me. Why are you saying that, Pastor Mike? Write this point down. Because the supernatural is often activated by something simple. Oh, the supernatural is usually activated by something, everybody say simple. Simple. Naaman wanted a grand presentation for his healing, for his miracle. And God was like, I'm gonna keep this real simple. Take a bath. (laughs) Now think about this. Do you not think that he has tried to take a bath before? Do you not think that he's tried to scrub off the leprosy before? But this man gets a new, fresh instruction. And that's going to be some of y'all's problem. Is God's going to give you a fresh instruction, not a new one. Ooh, you missed it. You're going to give and you're going to want a new instruction. And God said, no, 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 no. I'm just going to give it to you afresh. Go do the same thing I told you to do last year. Uh Uh-huh. Is that it? And some of y'all will go away with the same rage. I'm done with this thing. Crazy faith. He must think I'm crazy. And God said, I've been trying to tell you to do the same thing. The miracle is not in the spectacular. It's in the simple. And that's why I hate the devil. Because he loves making simple things complicated. I mean, literally, let's go back to the garden. The only instruction, don't eat in that tree. Just one. Do you know how many other trees was in the garden with fruit? It was everywhere. But the enemy tried to complicate a simple instruction. How simple could your miracle actually be if you just obeyed God? Okay. 
Y'all want to hear like a real story of my own life where I had to do something simple that felt crazy? All right. So when I started leading the church, I asked God to connect me with leaders who were supposed to help me build this church. Um, I found out that there was a young couple um, building a church called Eden in downtown Tulsa on Sunday nights. The reason I found out is because my little brother Grayson would ask me to drop him off there. And you know, I'm a fresh pastor one or two years in. And so um, it was a little offensive. (laughs) Y'all told me to be hot. It's a little offensive that my little brother, knowing that I'm a pastor, is asking with jubilation to participate every Sunday night in another church's activities. And I was like, okay, I'm a kingdom man, kingdom guy, kingdom. Come on, Grayson, get in the car, let's go. But as I'm rolling by, I'm with the window down, like who else is coming to this kingdom? Like, and then I found out a lot of our worship singers, worship leaders, a lot of different people were going to this expression. And what I do is I hold, I hold people like this. And I, I said, God, if this is something that you want to do, bless. I said, what is my instruction? So I want you to do something crazy. I want you to call that young man. I need you to reach out to him and ask him, what does he need? That's crazy, Lord. Because if I give him what he needs, he's going to take what I already have. <laughs> this is my flesh. Call him and ask him, what does he need? I was like, all right, I'm going to call Max and then he's like, yeah, Instagram, don't have his number, nothing like that. And then I was like, let's go to breakfast. And so the first time I meet Charles Metcalf, we're going to breakfast at, was it Chimera? At Chimera. And we go to breakfast and right before I walk into the church, to the uh, restaurant, the Holy Spirit says, ask him if he wants to shut down his church and join you. Now, I need you to understand how crazy this is because I'm not lame, and that sounded lame immediately. Because then that puts all the power in his court that he could be like, no, and like, why? And that's exactly what happened. I even gave a great analogy. I was like, we could be like the Golden State Warriors. I- this one KD was there and all of the thing. And I even used it. I was like, bro, this, we could be like, he's like, no. <laughs> and when I walked out of that restaurant, I felt lame, but I got a well done from God. No, 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 no. You missed it. Cause the crazy faith was not in if Charles became a part of transformation church. It was when he told me to ask another man that already, not in the infant stage, already started the church. Ask him, hey, let's get together. He said, when you set it out of your mouth, that's where the miracle happened. It would take another six to seven months with no expectation that that was going to actually happen until I was at the downtown library. And this young man came and found me with tears in his eyes. Not me saying, like, let's make a business plan. He said, God told me to shut down my church and come serve and do whatever you need. And that's where God said, what if you wouldn't have tried? No, I I, I just, I want you to see that the crazy faith miracle was not something big. It was something simple. Let me add this. That might seem stupid. I'm trying to give you cheat codes today. Let me just put it like this. Obedience is the main ingredient in miracles. It's the main ingredient. I know nobody's shouting about this because a lot, I'm going to say this, it's strong. I'm telling you, I'm warning you, it's strong what I'm about to say, okay? Brace yourself. A lot of the miracles you want to see are not because God is not able. It's because you are disobedient. I I at least want to be the one to tell you. 
Some of you, God's been speaking to you about this crazy faith offering and you have just said no. I don't see it. I don't have it. I'm not going to. I'm not. Some of you, he's been talking to you about things you need to do in your family, for your career, for your business. Some of you, he's been telling you to move. You are in the wrong geographical location. And you just, but all my family is here and all my things, but your favor's not there. You have just been disobedient. And more than amounts, God said, could I just please have your obedience in crazy faith? Okay. I'm almost done. Somebody say, I going to try again. Whatever that means for you, whatever that looks like, some of y'all need to go back to school. I'm 50. I ain't, I ain't doing another paper. <laughs> I, 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 get, I feel you. But rarely does God call you to something convenient. If you're actually going to be used by God, it is rarely convenient. And I started to think about Naaman, and then I started to think about, what if other people wouldn't have tried? Y'all remember that story in 1 Kings 17 where Elijah the prophet came, and the woman was like, oh, he was like, what you about to do? And she was like, I'm just about to make this little cake for me and my son, and then we're going to die. Y'all remember that? And then he was like, oh, yeah, cool. Don't do that. Make me the cake. Huh? No matter what her reaction is, she still tried it. She still, she tried. And there were miracles that unfolded over and over and over again in that woman's life because she, everybody said to me, tried. Y'all remember Joshua? Walking around Jericho seven times? Do y'all know how dumb that instruction was? No, 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 I need you to hear. Lord, we're about to take over the city. What do you want us to do? Walk around it seven times. Get trumpet players and blow on the seventh time and then take some jars and smash them. And you want me to go back and tell the troops, the ones who are built to actually fight with hands? Sometimes God will call you to do something that goes against your training. Why? So he can get the glory out of your life. Okay. So Mike, why are you so passionate about this? Because as I went back to 1519 yesterday, I went back to West Pine and I walked into that church and I sat in those green chairs where there are about 300 people filled with faith. There was no visual on our screens when we first gave in crazy faith of all of this. There was no YouTube there was no crazy faith. There was no Mike Todd. There was no relationship goals. There was nothing. It was just a vision. And 300 people believed in the vision that we could have a multi-ethnic church. Look around. Look around. That we could have a multiplying church. Look around. That we could have a multi-generational church. Look around. I was 27 years old standing up there like crack voice cracking. God gave me a vision. <laughs> and it was a simple step that God said, if you're going to be a blessing, bless somebody else. It was simple. And I've told this story, but I'm always telling it because it's my testimony. People are like, how did you become this crazy faith guy? By obeying God in simple stuff. And I stood up and I said, church, we're going to raise whatever money comes in and we're going to give it away. $8,300 we raised and we gave it to churches in North Tulsa. That was the craziest faith thing I had ever done as a pastor up until that point. And it unlocked something that allowed me to live at a place that has transformed not just my life, but the life of so many. But I will be darned. And I didn't want to use that word. I have a church 
that displays crazy faith and a people who don't live in it. I don't want to do this if it's going to be fake. I don't want to do this if you're struggling for 10 years to just pay your bills. And the church seems like it. I don't want to do this. Either it works for our marriages and raising kids and changing our communities or it doesn't. God is not praised by us just having a nice building. He wants to live in something that looks like walking faith. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. I wrote it in a point, the church having crazy faith is incomplete if you don't have crazy faith. All right. So what are you trying to say, Pastor Mike? If he said it, try it. If he said it, what do you have to lose? Step out in faith and try. If he said it, try it. Example, um, one of my friends brought this to my attention as I was telling him what I was going to preach. And it's crazy. I've told y'all several times, um, I wasn't the best at school, not because I wasn't smart, because I just didn't apply myself. I really like to make people laugh more than I liked language class. And so, um, I, um, Miss Maxwell, you don't call my teacher's names. Don't do that, Mama Chloe. You know my people. I love you, Miss Maxwell. I gave her the blues. Oh, my God. Um, but when God told me to try to write a book called Relationship Goals, I was fearful because I didn't think I had in me what it took to make it seem like a real book. Can I be honest? A real book, smart, very intelligent people write books. Me, I sit things on top of books. I have books for aesthetic. At that time, like my book collection was like three books that people gave to me. And what did God say to me? He said, try it. I remember opening my laptop and literally typing relationship goals. I literally remember it and I closed my laptop. Woo! That was a triumph. You missed it. Oh my God, if you could get it. I opened my laptop. Relationship goes. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. If you don't celebrate that, if you don't get some energy and expectation around that, you will be waiting forever. And um, my friend brought this out the back. He said, what is this? He literally asked, what is this? I said, oh, that's relationship goals in Hungarian. You missed it. He said, what do you mean? I said, I don't know how to say any word inside of this book. The only words I can read is Michael Todd. And I guess handsome black men don't make covers in Hungary. They changed my whole art direction, but <laughs> they was like, take his face off of it, uh, put a dart, <laughs> but I'm okay with it because <laughs> the check's still cleared. <laughs> Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. You missed it. But, but what? What I was reminded of is that the faith didn't come full manifest when it was in a different language. It was when I opened my laptop and I wrote relationship goals. 
God said, there it is. You gave me something to work with. Now, now I thought that was enough, but I called one of the people on my team. I was like, ain't the book in other languages? They said, yeah. Relationship goals is in Spanish, Hungarian, Russian, Chinese, Norwegian, Portuguese, Dutch, and French. I said, I ain't been to none of them places. It couldn't have multiplied without a try. Okay. And crazy faith is in Swedish, Russian, Hungarian, Dutch. If you gave me a map, most of those places I can't point out. But God was able to do a miracle with a try. What you, what you want me to try, Pastor Mike? Whatever the simple instruction God gave you is. Everybody say try it. Try it. I'm going back to Naaman. Because Naaman, he got a simple instruction that seemed crazy or stupid, and he had to do it. I just want to paint this picture for you real quick. Oh, because this is how dumb it'll seem to other people. Ooh. Ooh. That is cold. That felt like enough to me. But half obedience is disobedience. How many more do I got? This seems excessive. This is cold. This feels stupid. Nobody else is having to do this. This feels like a mess. But if he said seven times, but if he told me to forgive, but if he told me to give, how many more do I got? Somebody said two, somebody said three. How many do I got? Look, people looking around now like, which one? Carry the two? This water is so cold. Hold the mic, John. Oh, shoot. Three more? My outfit is ruined. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I may not be accepted in some places like this. Here, here. I'm, I'm just trying to make it real for you. Like, like, this has altered how you might see me. 
Because if you weren't with me when I started this process and you just saw me on dip number four, you may judge me. But I can't let your opinion stop me from being obedient. Y'all say number five when I go down this time. Y'all ready? One more and I'm healed. One more and my family is delivered. One more and I'm the lender and not the borrower. Come on, I, I need y'all to hear what I'm saying. One more obedience step in crazy faith. I've done it over and over and over and over and over again. But if I do it one more time, Pastor Mike, what are you saying to us? Don't quit on six. Some of y'all like, just do it. But that's what God's been asking you to do for years. Don't quit on six. Naaman didn't know if the miracle was going to happen on one or seven. But he knew he was given an instruction. And I wonder how many times he would have done it if he knew healing was on the other side of it. Quitting on six is a trick. It's the lie that the enemy wants you. It's not going to work. When you give this time, it's going to be the same thing that happened last time. When you try to serve again, when you ask for forgiveness, when you show up, when you show yourself, they're going to do you like the other. Don't quit on six. Y'all would have nightmares if I didn't finish this example. Somebody will come dump themselves. I'm doing this in proxy for Pastor Mike. Hear me when I say this. If you want me to finish an example, how much more does God want you to actually obey him to the point where your crazy faith creates a crazy miracle? Let's do this thing right now. But the miracle only happens with simple obedience. In just a few minutes, we're about to give. But this is not about giving today. This is about obedience. Oh, shoot. I forgot my last examples in my pocket. Well. Didn't think that one all the way through. <laughs> um, so I want you to know that faith is relative at every level. I don't care if you balling or you broke. God will always require something that makes you dependent on him. So me and Natalie talked earlier last week. God, what do you want us to give? He told me what he wanted us to give and we did not have it. I said, Lord, isn't it like you? Why didn't you ask me for what I gave three years ago? He said, because I always want you to be stretching your faith to believe me. I said, all right. 
So I was in a meeting last week with Miss Tammy, and um, I had asked her, because I work for the church, I had asked her to take a certain amount of my paycheck and send it to a different bank to pay for something. Like when you get your direct deposit, you can allocate where the money goes to, like what bank account. And so I'd done this maybe three years ago. And I found, I remembered just supernaturally because I had decided in my heart, I was going to obey you, God. If this is what you told me to give, somehow you're going to get it to me. Because I've decided in my heart, you're going to do it. Well, I, I remembered in this meeting for the first time in three years. And I looked at Tammy, I said, Tammy. And she was like, yes. <laughs> I said, did we ever cancel that money going to that other bank? She said, I don't think so. Let me look. She says, as a matter of fact, no, it's all over there. I said, but didn't I pay the thing off earlier this year? She said, yeah. I said, let me get on my app and see if the money is. And y'all, when I decided in my heart that I was going to obey God, he made me forget so I could obey. So I went to the bank on Friday, drove all the way to Owasso. And I said, uh, there should be this much money in the bank because you uh, please give my money. <laughs> Ain't nothing like knowing it's there. And then she said, oh, um, that amount's not in there. I said, hold on now. She said, it's not that amount, it's about 80% of that. I said, oh, okay, oh, all right, well, okay, cool. Give me all of that. And I said, God, I thought you told me. He said, I did. So I went to the bank Saturday, and you know, Arvis and all our little banks, they open from eight to 12. So I go in there to try to break all the little coins I had from all of the little place. I said, my kids, we eating ramen noodles for the rest of the year. No, I'm just playing. But I was, I mean, it's sacrifice. I, I'm not telling y'all something I'm not doing. I want you to hear me say that. This is not, something I'm not living out. So I go to scrape my things up and they was like, well, this is all you can get. I said, just give me that too. And I said, God, I thought you said, I woke up this morning. I'm not talking about 10 days ago, this morning. I said, God, I thought you said you was gonna do it. He said, I did. He said, look in your drawer. Now I look at this drawer every day. But I forgot my mother and father-in-law brought me a piece of mail that got delivered to their house instead of my house. And I never looked at what was in it. And I opened this up and it was a check from the government for the exact amount that I was short. Oh, y'all, okay. Y'all don't have to believe with me, but this wet piece of paper is proof that God is real. When the scripture says he'll give seed to the sower. Pastor Mike, why is this important when it comes to faith? Because the truth of the matter is, your finances expose the priority of your heart. I'm trying to speed up a life that God has for you. When you can obey him with unrighteous mammon is what the Bible calls it. He says he'll make you then ruler of true riches. True riches has nothing to do with dollar amounts, but God can't give you what he really has for you because you won't get let go of what he gave you. So as your pastor, I'm standing here in wet, crazy faith. We're going to need a dryer uh, in the back. because. But this is proof. I am confident. We are evidence. And you are faithful, you are God. Standing all over this building. Here in just a moment, um, there are gonna be boxes and different things that are around. There's gonna be a holy moment. The worship team is gonna come and 
They're going to worship. People have flown and drone here, drove here from all over the world. Somebody told me there's somebody from Canada and there's somebody like, what? Y'all came from Canada and Florida and California. And like, this is crazy. Thank y'all. Thank you. Detroit. Oh, y'all the ones drove 15 hours? This is, this is beautiful. But I just don't want you to do an act of giving money and not give God your heart. I want you to obey God. I want to pray for every person under the sound of my voice. That there would be an increase of the measure of faith in your life. And hear me, hear me. I want to be very clear with this. If you give nothing today, that does not take away this message that God has given you to be able to try. God won't ask you for something you don't have. Okay, this is not about manipulation or anything. What I want you to do is live in another level that is provided for you if you would just try. And today I believe some people are getting their try back. <laughs> You're about to step out in faith. There's triumph in trying again. There are cards that we have attached to our faith. Oh man, I didn't even tell y'all the best part about Naaman's story. It's so crazy, like, he gets healed and then he goes to Elijah and is like, I need to give you something. I need to offer a sacrifice. I need to give you some money. And he's like, no, nah, I don't need none of that. He was like, let me please do something because the, the response to a miracle is sowing. All through the Bible, it's a bi biblical precedent. But, but, but he wouldn't let him. And so do you know what Naaman said? He said, let me at least gather some of the ground where this miracle happened so I can take it back to my land. The only reason you take some of the ground is because soil is the place that you plant See, He said, the miracle that happened here, I need to take a piece of this soil and take it back to my hand because I got to have a place where I can see miracles like this happen over and over again. The miracles that are about to happen in our lives are going to come through simple obedience. Would you lift your hands all over this place, watching online, watching on rebroadcast? This is not just a moment that we're doing this Sunday. Crazy faith offering going to be happening the rest of this year. Because some of y'all, you're hearing this message and you're like, God, I will obey. I will try. I'm going to use my faith again. I'm going to do what you called me to do. And this is the moment where God is going to use you to move into another level of faith. Father, I've done what you asked me to do. I didn't stop on six. I didn't quit short of the miracle. And Father, there's so many people that are so close to another level of breakthrough. But the trauma tried to steal their try. Today, God, will you restore everything that the, the enemy has tried to steal? Father, I thank you that people are trying again in relationships, trying again in service, trying again to do what you called them to do. Father God, I'm thanking you that this is a revelation that leads to a revolution. I bind the spirit of fear that will come over every person who would say, what if God doesn't come through? You're a good father. And God, today we are reminded of who you are. You're chasing after us. You are actually looking to do good in our lives, Father, because it brings you glory when your children, Father God, are representing you on this earth. Today, I thank you for all the people who are moving in crazy faith. From the seeds that they sow, to the decisions that they make to obey you. God, I thank you that this marks a new moment in our ministry. This is not about amounts, it's only about obedience. And let it be said of Transformation Church that we were a body that was obedient to whatever God said. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to experience crazy faith and very simple obedience. There is triumph and us trying again. Bless every seed. Bless every business. Father, as people are giving even out of their need, Father, I'm asking you, Father, to prove 
the doubt wrong. Would you be God? So as Naaman said, Father, I know there is no God except the God at Transformation Church. The God of the Bible. Father, let it be to your credit. Not mine, not anybody else's. For your glory only. Today we give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you praise. If you're in this room, you've never accepted Jesus. We're going to give in a second. More than anything you could give as a sacrifice, your life is more important. Today, if you want to make Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, if you walked away from him, today, the most crazy faith step you can make is super simple. In a moment, we're going to all pray together. And all God's asking you to do is accept him. Make him the Lord of your life. How do I do that? Romans 10, 9. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's that simple. Church wants to make it hard. Religion wants to make it hard. But Jesus said, if you just do this, two simple steps. He said, and then I'll help you change all the other stuff. I'll help you. I'll help you change your habits. If that's you, today, the greatest miracle is something super simple. He's going to change your heart your simple confession if that's you on the count of three I just want you to lift your hand number one you're making the greatest decision of your life number two I see your hands sweetheart your name is about to be written in the Lamb's book of life number three with faith and boldness I see you my brother I see you my brother I see you my sister I see you my sister transformation church how do we celebrate glory to God online in the comments just put a hand we're rejoicing at Transformation Church, nobody prays alone. We all pray together. So would everybody just say, God, thank you for sending Jesus just for me. Today, I repent and I turn to you. I believe you lived, you died, and you rose again just for me. Today, I make a commitment to serve you all the days of my life change me renew me transform me i'm yours in jesus name amen can we shout unto god with the voice of triumph i'm so proud of you i'm so proud of you i'm so proud of you and what a better opportunity than right now to exercise your faith and to sow if you just got saved i want you to click that qr code we're going to give you some information. We're going to stay connected with you. And right now, we're going to sow in crazy faith. There's boxes all over. If you're next to a box, I want you to um, raise your hand. Online, you can give. And everybody, I want you to fill out your crazy faith card. This is not a slot machine. This is not a, I gave, and so I'm expecting the 19 things for it to happen the way I want it to happen. Remember, Naaman's problem is he thought. But if you say, God, I'm going to obey you in what you say to give. And however you want to do this. Everybody say, have your way. Today, some of you are going to sit. Some husbands and wives are renegotiating what they thought they was going to do. All I'm asking you to do is obey God. When you obey him, it opens something for a miracle that you've never seen. Father, bless every person as we worship and as we give. From all over this place, whenever you decide, I believe the floor is going to be ushered. So everybody that's on the sides, y'all just wait a second. We're going to try to do this decent in order and we're going to worship God as we give because giving is an act of worship. The floor is going to give first and then everybody's going to come. And if you need to slip out, there's giving boxes and all this stuff. We're not going to make this hard. This is simple. But today we're going to give believing God's about to do something crazy in our lives. Amen. Can y'all just lift your hands and say this? I just want to say this, say Yahweh, Yahweh, reign over and take over. Ushers, just lead them and everybody say, say Yahweh. The Spirit of God is still moving. The service is over, but I believe the Spirit of God has been speaking to you this whole time. I want you to respond to whatever God is saying to do in obedience. Like, did you, did you hear what the message was? It's the miraculous thing that God wants to do is wrapped up in your try. And I believe that somebody's getting the faith to try again, trying to go back.
to that place where you were hurt before, but going back knowing that you're there to be the answer to the problem, not needing an answer from them. Trying to use your faith again to build and not to tear down. And whatever God is telling you to do, all I'm asking you to do is obey. If Transformation Church has ever been a blessing to you, or God is speaking to you right now that you're supposed to sow a seed, all I'm gonna ask you to do, do it. I've lived a life of crazy faith, and it's always been the simple things that God asked me to do that created spectacular moments in my life. It's not about amounts, it's about obedience. This is not a plea or a cry, this is an opportunity for you to walk into another level of faith. And I believe that after that message, and what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, you're gonna try. I love you, let me pray for you. Father, thank you for my brother. Thank you for my sister. Thank you for that family that's watching. I thank you, Father God, that you're gonna prove yourself strong by hearing and answering their prayers and moving them from faith to faith. Let us know, Father God, that there's triumph in trying to be it. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. I'll see you next week. Peace.